This is Real Estate Rookie Show number 53. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson, and we just had to do a retake because I almost called him Tommy Boy. (laughs) So, Tony, we have had a couple of Rookie Reply episodes out now, and I want to know how everyone is liking them. So if you guys haven't heard about it yet, um, on Saturdays, we are releasing another episode. It's just uh, Tony and I, and we are answering your guys' questions. So we're pulling voicemail questions. We're pulling uh, questions from the Facebook group. We're pulling questions from Instagram. Then we're also thinking of topics that we think rookies need to know and learn about. Uh, So make sure you guys check that out. They start at episode 50. It's just Ashley and I, right? No one else. And it's just a really relaxed kind of conversation between us. You know, sometimes it's, you know, something that Ashley knows more about, something that sometimes I know a little bit more about. And, you know, we're educating each other as we go along as well. So it's been a really fun and cool process. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. Like, let us know, you know, let, you know, head up Ashley, hit hit me up on Instagram or in the the Rookie Real Estate group on Facebook. Um, And yeah, let us know what you guys think. Yeah. So today we have a great guest. We have Christy on and she set her mind out knowing she just wanted to quit her W-2 job with really no plan in place. And so what she did was she found real estate and figured out how that would work for her. And then she got her first deal and quit her job. So uh, let's uh, bring Christy on and learn a little bit more about her story and how her and her husband have done that. They're also doing out of state. They're doing a little bit of everything. And I think the really cool part about her story, and you'll you'll hear this at the end, but she was able to double her W-2 income with 18 months of real estate investing, which is like insane, insane. So you guys are in for a good story for sure. Christy Lesage, welcome to The Real Estate Rookie. Super excited to have you on today. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. You've got an amazing story. Excited to dive into it. But before we, we get into all the, the meat and potatoes, uh, just tell us a little bit about you. You know, what, what, what's your journey? What's your story? And, and what brought you to, to the real estate game? My story kind of started a couple of years back, but it was definitely a slow burn. I mean, real estate was not the initial answer for me at all. I was in kind of the nine to five corporate world, uh, working for Hilton with a I would call it a nice cushy sales job because um, hotel sales, at least back pre-pandemic, was pretty pretty fun. You were always entertaining clients and doing fun stuff, going out, eating and drinking. So definitely had a very, very nice corporate world job and was pretty happy with it. And it really kind of, I guess, started right when I went on this three-day backpacking trip with my girlfriends to Yosemite. And I just remember having like the best time of my life being, you know, out in the wilderness and kind of really just taking it all in, having your phone off. And I just remember thinking, wow, like this, this is more of kind of what life is all about. I mean, it's not, not all about sitting in a cubicle every day. And I think that really just kind of opened my eyes on how I wanted to kind of take my life more in my control and be able to go and do more things like that. And I remember coming home and I think it was that exact night and talking to my husband and he said, or I remember telling him, I, I want to quit my job. And he was like, okay, (laughs) sure. And he was like, well, what are you going to do to make money? And I was like, well, I mean, I don't know. That's <laughs> a good question. And uh, at the time, it wasn't really kind of the initial answer, real estate. Uh, it's something he always was kind of looking into. His bar- parents have done quite a bit of uh, real estate investing throughout their life, um, but not something I was introduced to. Um, my father was more of a business owner and he kind of had the nine to five job. So I, I just had no, I guess, interest or guidance on that side. And I remember at the time, my father was like, well, why don't you learn how to trade options? And that's kind of what kind of started and geared me towards um, kind of making some extra money on the side. And so everything was going great. And and I started making money doing that while still working my full-time W-2 job. And I was kind of like, it's getting a little cocky, like, well, why am I working now? Because I'm making more money you know, sometimes then I am at my W2 job in a month and Spencer's like, well, it's not really like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a little volatile. Like that's not always going to be like that. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Um, so anyways, and then it was 
January 2019, and I did get a phone call, unfortunately, that my mother passed away. And that um, kind of triggered, you know, kind of that whole like feeling again of like, you know, life short. Um, I, I don't really want to be here anymore. And I like I, at my job and I was really struggling internally with that um, and was not like mentally present at work. And I just really, you know, didn't necessarily take enough time to grieve. And it was really putting me in a hard, hard spot. And I just remember kind of all those emotions from that Yosemite trip really just kind of like, um, I guess came front and center again. I was like, I just, I just can't do this anymore. And it was like April, 2019, right before Easter. And my boss pulled me in to his office at the time. And he kind of kept saying like, I, you know, your performance is lagging. And I thought it was, you know, I was doing okay. I was like, I think it's just, you know, the market right now, but regardless of who was right, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, it it, it was, the numbers were lacking and he was like, I just, I just don't think, you know, you're, you're over, you know, the, the passing of your mother. And I think it's still eating you up inside. And I remember being so angry when he was saying that to me, cause I felt like I was doing okay, which clearly I wasn't because if it was like still bothering me and rubbing me the wrong way, I, I clearly wasn't over it. So I, I came home that night and I told my husband I'm quitting at the end of the summer. And I was like, all right, I guess so. Like we're, you know, we're going for it. And he was like, well, yeah, like you're trading options. That's great. Like you're making money, but like, I mean, like I said, this, you know, we still have to figure something out. Like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And we really, really wanted to at the time, or I did at least buy like a nice house up on the hill, you know, with the down payment, which like we could have afforded at the time, the down payment, but we would have been tied to our W2 jobs for 30 years and definitely having that monthly payment. Like it just was not the right decision. And hindsight, I'm so glad we didn't like kind of fall into that, you know, initial trap. It was just not the right move for us. We did like, I did not want to work past the summer, let alone like the next 30 years. So, and he was kind of like the one, like, why don't we take this money and, you know, put it into an investment property here? I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I don't, you know, we're, if, if this goes right, like, you know, you'll be pretty close, you know, to making what you were making at Hilton, but we can kind of keep s- snowballing that. Like eventually it's going to snowball and it's kind of a long-term retirement plan once it's paid off. And I'm like, yeah. And he was already on the bigger pockets, like train. I think he was listening to more of the podcasts and everything at the time. And I was kind of like, all right, let's do it. And kind of when I get my hat head wrapped around something, I'm just like, let's go. And I'm like, I don't even think I listened to one podcast was even on bigger pockets. I remember he was telling me, I'm like, we need to find a realtor. Like we need to find a realtor. And he's like, okay, that's fine. I'll just go look on bigger pockets for one. And I'm like, what? I was like, okay, whatever you go figure that out. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, let's figure rocks. I'm like, whatever, who cares? And <laughs> so we kind of went and he was interviewing he interviewed two realtors off of bigger pop kits. I remember it so vividly. And it's funny he was doing this now, like at the time, because like I said, I still had nothing. Like, I'm just like, let's do it. Let's not, I, I hate wasting time. I hate being inefficient. So and I'm like, well, you've been researching this for so long. Your parents do it. Like, I think, I think, you know, we should be able to figure this out if your parents have figured this out. And so it was kind of like the good push he needed because he's kind of like, you know, just, learns and educates himself and um he he he's doesn't take as quick of action and i'm kind of just like all right makes sense in my head let's let's see what happens and so he interviewed two realtors on bigger pockets and one was kind of this like investor guy general contractor and he was like yeah you know what i'm not your guy if you want to walk through 40 homes like i, I don't have time for that and honestly if it's a good deal, I'm just going to buy it myself. And we're like, okay, not the right person for us. <laughs> he's like, but I can tell you it needs to be fixed. And we're like, well, my husband, he's a director of engineering at a hotel. So he has a pretty good grasp on like, you know, maintenance and contracting. And we're like, okay, not, not the right person at all. So he called the next one and it was a gal in San Diego. And she actually worked at kind of a large brokerage form 
firm who specialized in apartments. So we were like a very, very small fish. But the cool thing was, and I saw, I forgot to ask her, but I'm pretty sure we were one of her first multifamily like deals. So she was still very like new and green and gave us like all the attention. Like, but we also kind of like figured, had, you know, figured out what we needed at the time. And I remember we went into the, the brokerage or firm and sat down and kind of like talked with her and her boss. And they're like, okay, well, what are you looking for? And I think prior to that, I was looking at a couple deals in our college town in Michigan. So I like kind of knew like the cash flow that we wanted, you know what I mean? And and we're in San Diego, of course. And I was like, yeah, like we really need to be cash flowing probably at least like 2000, like net 2,500 a month. <laughs> And they kind of like, 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 okay, (laughs) we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll work on that. And we're like, okay. So I was like, no, no, I'm sticking to my guns. Like there's no, you know, it doesn't make sense otherwise. And still very new. Like I said, had not (laughs) listened to bigger pockets or really understood appreciation or markets at the time. And we were really lucky where she found us a couple deals right away. She was amazing and just sending us a bunch. And it, we'll go more into this later. Like you said, we're just kind of, um, but she found us a deal right away that had some like bonus space and we were able to honestly make the numbers work. And I still think it's like one of our best properties. And we were kind of off to the races from there. And we got that under contract July, 2019. And we closed August, 2019. And it kind of went back to that conversation I had with my husband in April, like not even thinking like, I'm like, I'm quitting my job end of summer. Like I literally think I said I was going to quit my job August 27th or 28th before we even had a house under contract. Like I just, it was in my mind and it just kind of all fell into place like that. I mean, I did push the lenders extremely hard to make sure we closed early because something I did not realize is do not quit your W2 job before you close on a house because I was about to make that terrible, terrible mistake of quitting prior to closing on the house. So I held it out a couple more days and I came in the following Monday after we closed and gave them like four days notice because we I had like four weeks of vacations already <laughs> planned. I'm like, well, I can come back to work after this. And they're like, I mean, no offense. Like you're great, but we're a very well-oiled machine over here. Like we're going to, we're going to be okay. Like it was kind of a crazy story that it just fell into yeah, place you, like that. You, you've got a really interesting story and like there, there's so many like nuggets there that I want to, I want to poke yeah. at, but I, I think the first thing I want to hit on is you, you mentioned that you had this idea of buying a bigger home mm-hmm. and you, you knew that you guys could afford it, but that it was going to, to kind of tie you down for the next 30 years. Yeah. And I, I think it's such, you know, we, we talk about this a lot about people being able to, or being willing to sacrifice to kind of kickstart their real estate investing mm-hmm. career. And like, have you guys played the, the cash flow game, the, the Robert Kiyosaki cash flow game? Um, I have so it, like, but I want to. No, it, it's a good game. They, and Is they it? have like an iPad app to you. That's what, what my son and I usually play on. Oh, but like you win the game by getting out of the rat race and you get out of right. the rat race when your cash flow exceeds your expenses. So there's two right. ways that you like, there's two pieces of that that you need to tackle. You need yeah. to dramatically increase your income, but you also need to keep your expenses in check or reduce them. And my son, it's so funny. Like whenever we play this game, like you're, you're given a profession mm-hmm. and the profession that he loves to get is like the janitor or, yeah. you know, like the, the maintenance man, like the, and, and this yeah. isn't to disrespect janitors, janitors or maintenance right, men, but he, he hits getting the jobs with the big salaries, like the, the you know, the, the doctors, the airline pilots, yeah. because they also have big expenses. And he's like, I can always get out of the rat race faster when I have lower expenses. So, so even smart. at 13 years old, like he understands this, but back to my main point is like, I, I think it's so cool that you guys made that decision to say, we're going to hold off on kind of inflating our lifestyle to make sure we can support our real estate investing goals. You know, we talk about this a lot and kind of you guys have been really hounding on it a lot more lately on your podcast. I think my why at the time was so big in my head, like I need a quit my nine to five job. I need to quit it. And at the time, that's not it anymore, but at the time that was my why. And, you know, everything else I was, you know, whatever we had to do to get there, I was like, I know I will be genuinely just so happy if I can just kind of quit my job and go 
do what I want and live the life how I want to and not like kind of have, you know, always these restrictions and uh, the sacrifices you make are, you know, they're, they're not that like drastic <laughs> like in, in hindsight of it. I mean, I think it's worth tenfold and I think you just need to identify really what's important to you. And I think your whole story shows that is that yeah. you knew what, exactly what you wanted and you went after it. Right. So now that we heard a little bit about your first deal, but what does your portfolio look like now? So your first closing was August 2019. What yes. Um, and so that was a four unit. And as I mentioned, there's a bo- bonus kind of space in the back. So we do have a fifth tenant we rent out to. It's like a warehouse space. So we have five units in San Diego. And then we kind of sat on it. Um kind of through, you know, until 2020, early 2020, and we're still kind of, uh, I don't know, you know I mean, trying to figure out what to do next, because to keep investing in San Diego, I mean, it, it, I, as you know, Tony, there's quite a big barrier to entry, like, especially if you're not living in the property, you're putting down 20, 25% down on a property out here. So it, it's quite a big barrier to entry. And we're kind of like, oh, I don't know. And so we finally decided to make a pivot to out of state real estate investing this summer. And we were just so happy. We finally made that jump and we uh, started investing back in Michigan. And that is where we both went to school um, in Michigan at Ferris state university. And my husband's from Michigan and that's where, you know, his parents live. And so we're kind of looking at kind of these like little migration patterns. And we were looking at where all our friends were moving to after college, because where my husband grew up in the Grand Rapids area. I mean, personally, I think it's a little overinflated for Michigan prices, like at least for rental uh, property investing. So we kind of were looking at the migration patterns on where our friends were moving. And that's kind of how we started to identify a market. Um, so, oh, and then we picked up another eight units in, I guess we closed August, 2020, but it was a package deal. So it was like a five unit property and a three unit property and you had to buy both. So we were really excited about that. And then I think that put us uh, five plus eight, that's 13 doors. And then we picked up another three unit in December of this year, um, just kind of continuing to grow it, um, kind of get more of that cash flow. We were like, liked being a little diversified because we're getting so much appreciation out here that it was nice to really ramp up on the cash flow uh, back in Michigan. And then as of tomorrow, I mean, knock on wood, we are signing and we are closing on a eight unit property, legitimate commercial or not a commercial, I guess, multifamily, uh, but on a commercial loan. So it's not like kind of that package deal anymore. So we're really, really excited about that. And that will put us at 24 doors. That is so awesome. Yeah. All just, I mean, really most of it within a year, really. Yeah. I, I would say, yeah, a year and a half. I mean, 2020 was pivotal. I mean, we, like I said, we did our first deal August, 2019. And then, yeah, we really kind of went back to the drawing board and July. I mean, July seems to be our year where like we can never plan any vacations in July because we just like have like these kind of crazy pivotal moments and we're like, let's go. And it's crazy. And so, yeah. And we just, I, from July, 2020 to February, 2021. Yeah. We've closed on a lot of door, 19 doors in Michigan. So yeah, How very are you exciting. Financing all of these deals. So you had your down yeah. payment for your first one, and then mm-hmm. did you do a conventional residential loan on that? And then what about the other ones? Yeah. So the first one was the twenty five percent down. So quite a hefty barrier to entry, I would say, and conventional financing. And honestly, the first time going through conventional financing, and like I said, not knowing much about real estate, like that was kind of like just a nightmare to me. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I don't understand all these fees, these loan estimates, like they don't make sense to me. I'm like, they're trying to rip us off. Like, this is crazy. And I mean, then we're like shopping around and like, oh my God, the first time going through financing, like, please, like if you're a rookie listening to this, like, don't worry. I feel like everyone goes through it. It's just like, what, what, what is this? So, but now it's like, okay, I understand how this works. And then the second deal, the package deal was actually kind of interesting because it was a five unit property. Um, so you would technically have to do like portfolio or commercial lending and then a three unit property. We were trying to do conventional, I remember. And we only talked to like a couple banks and we talked to our friend who was a loan officer and they're like, you're not going to be able to get conventional financing right now because your DTI is too high from that other property because you haven't owned it for a year. And we're like, what? 
like, no, that's, you know what I mean? And we were kind of like looking around and I, we didn't look around too hard, but that ended up being the consensus kind of that our DTI was too high unless we owned it for a full year, which would have been like a month later, but I was a little impatient. So we just kind of went and jumped on it and got it under contract. Um, and then we had, I think we basically were like, well, we'll put down basically as much cash as we could. I think the property was around 174 for the two. We negotiated down 170. Eight. So we basically were able to come up with the seventy four, seventy five thousand um, dollars. But we did get a ten year note loan that his parents pulled from a HELOC, and we ended up putting them on a ten year note, and we are paying them like six percent. So at least they're getting a return on their money because we were exploring the hard money route, and we're just like, ah, this deal just really would like not look as good if, you know, we're paying 12%. So we kind of went back to his parents and were like, okay, we actually went to his grandma's estate first. And then everyone kind of got word, you know, about what we're doing and see if we could pull a loan out of there and pay them a 6% interest rate. And his parents were like, oh, why don't we just do it? Like, we don't want, you know, let's just do it this way. We have enough equity in this um, building that we can pull it out. And so we kind of did a promissory note with them and we were able to pay them um, a small return because I think they're paying the bank like 2.75. So we're paying them a small like 3% return uh, on a 10-year note that we plan on actually probably starting a refi on in the next few days to get them out. That's and then, sorry, more than they would get in a bank though. Yeah, exactly. So we're like, we try and always like, I always say this, like if you're trying to like throw out an offer or like offer someone like a deal like that, like, would you accept it? And that's kind of where we're at. Like, yeah, I probably would accept like a 6%, you know, interest rate to help my, um, help my kids out or friends or family. And they're making a little bit of dividend. And I think his dad at the time was like, I'm having a tough time getting 3% in the market right now. You know, I, I, it just, he was just kind of like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So it worked out. Well, one one question I want to clarify before we go on to the other deals. Um, you you said that you, you your DTI was impacted because you didn't own that first investment property mm-hmm. for a year. For for the folks that aren't following that, can you just quickly explain like like why that was a negative impact? Yeah. Why, so like what happens after a year? Our debt and to income DTI. Yeah. <laughs> DTI. Yeah. Is, what does it even yeah. mean? Yeah. yeah. So our debt to income ratio was too high because. We had essentially a $530,000 mortgage out on this investment property. So our payment each month was around $3,400, we'll say. And even though we're cash flowing X number, the bank doesn't count that until you have owned it, I guess, for a year or you have one year of tax returns. It kind of, I think, differs bank to bank depending on their lending requirements. So they were seeing it as... um, negative like 3400 and against us and we were seeing it as well we're actually positive you know 16 2000 dollars whatever and they're like no we can't we can't lend to you for that and then i also wasn't working so it was our 1099 uh, or i didn't have like two years of self employment to add up so we're just going off of my husband's income so they're looking at the ratio and they're like oh you're like a 50 or 70% debt to income ratio. And we're like, no, we aren't, but okay. So that's kind of like how they look at it on paper, even though you have leases in place, they don't, depending on the lender, they don't necessarily count it. So, like you said, it'll vary by the bank, yeah. vary by, by the lender. Um, so sorry, let's talk about quickly how you finance those last two deals. For the one we closed on in December, I would say it was a little, I guess, Conventional. We just did conventional financing again. It was such a cheap property. I think we got it for $78,000. And then we were able to just put down the 25% down payment. So for the third property, we just did standard conventional financing. And then this last, or I guess that was technically the fourth property. And then the last property that we are closing on tomorrow was our first time doing a commercial loan through um, a commer- or a bank. So that was an eight unit and their process for lending actually seemed a lot easier. I mean, the biggest thing they look for is a personal uh, financial statement. So they really look at kind of your net worth. They don't really look at DTI as much as long as you have leases in place, proper rent rolls, et cetera. 
So I think the important thing, Chrissy, that from, from your story is that there's so many different ways to uh, like get a deal finance, right? You had conventional, mm-hmm. you had the HELOC, now you went with the commercial route. So there's a lot of different ways to get it done. And then, you know, I think people might be listening and saying, you know, I don't have a ton of cash to get, you know, multiple deals mm-hmm. done in a year, but mm-hmm. the important thing is to think about the creativity and all the different ways to get mm-hmm. it done. So I love that you explained that for us. You know, now you've got this kind of really big portfolio um, what are some things that you're doing, some systems or things you have in place to help you uh, like manage these now almost 24 units that you have? My husband and I, we still self-manage um, our portfolio and we're really trying to be able to do this remote. We have explored the idea of property management, but with me, you know, not working a full-time W-2 and I, I really do as of right now, enjoy managing our own portfolios just to make sure they're up to like that peak performance, um, and make, sh- making sure everything's in place. So kind of the systems we have down right now is that, I kind of manage all of the financing, uh, the realtors. I do all of our books, the paperwork, the leases. I we used to work um, in hotels. So kind of like that contract sales, I kind of understand like some, I guess, verbiage that should be included in those leases. And then I also get the day-to-day tenant communication, which is can always be fun. And he more so ha- manages all of our contractors, our handy handyman. And then he also is kind of... I have tasked him with the city planning board. So really look into like your city and what they're doing and kind of that path of progress area, because we found out about a really cool program about this last deal that we're investing in the city where they will replace uh, if it's like kind of a lead based building or I can't remember all of the details, but they will come in and replace all of the windows and doors on your building. If you fill out this application and apply, which is a huge um huge advantage. So he manages that and he hand it, hand manages like all the maintenance calls and kind of like the day-to-day operation of the building. So kind of the way we have it divided, it really kind of allows our free time. And we've tried to kind of stay in our lanes doing it that way, which has made it more of a systemized process um, to make it I, I'm more reasonable. What do you, what have you done right now to kind of put systems in place to eventually outsource this? Or do you think maybe you would even hire someone and keep it in-house? I think we are trying to hire someone and keep it in-house, especially as our uh, portfolios grow in kind of two main markets. I just kind of like the idea of being able to like control the numbers a little better and kind of be able to know where the um, money is going. So recently last week, my husband, we finally, we've gone through at least like three or four handyman in Michigan now. And I think we finally found one (laughs) that we're like, okay, you're going to be our go-to guy from now. And we're just calling you. Like, I think we finally have one now, which is great because he's been at like our properties now probably for like two or three days straight. It almost seemed like, which was really nice. Um, just, to kind of have that go-to guy. So just having a handyman in place. And then I really like kind of the Airbnb turnover process. And I know Tony, you talked about this a lot is having a really good cleaning person. So we haven't had an apartment turnover yet in Michigan, knock on wood. And I'm sure that will (laughs) be coming shortly, but I really like the idea of having a really good cleaning person going in after the tenant. And even if you have the showings lined up ahead of time, have the cleaning person show it while she's there. So I think that's going to be kind of a process or system we're going to try and implement and test out going forward because because I personally want to screen the tenants we're putting in there and I want, you know, to kind of have the lease and go through that process. Um, so I know who's going in there. We just need someone who's going to do kind of the showings and be there to flip the apartment. So having that good handyman, Tony, like you said, and cleaning person, um, I think will be a good step system system moving forward. I want to know how are you finding these people and then vetting them, especially yeah. being remotely. Are you flying out right. there to? to no. <laughs> how is that happening since you've gone through a couple of them? One thing that I can't remember who who found it, but um, your neighborhood Facebook groups are really good tools to use, especially when looking for like contractors and stuff. So we are in a neighborhood Facebook group in that area, and you'll see contractors, handyman, plumbers post all the time about their businesses, this and that, even roofers. We found a roofer to do a roof. And then my husband kind of calls them, vets them. We are trying to interview them a little better because some of them are like 
not necessarily as <laughs> legitimate as we would uh, like them to be. Like we want to make sure they're going to fill out a W-9, um, especially if they're going to do a job over $600. So he has found a lot of the handyman. We haven't, but that's where we'll post for a cleaning lady too, or even landscaping. I think he found a high school person on there wants to help with mowing the lawns. And <laughs> so, you know what I mean? You, you can find like good work in in those um, kind of Facebook groups. And even if you just do like a little post, like, Hey, I'm looking for this, blah, 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 this and that you'll usually get quite a few responses. I love the Facebook groups and I've, mm -hmm. I, there's like really active Facebook groups around short-term rentals, like in the different markets mm -hmm. that I'm in as well. So like we, we found at least one handyman and one cleaner through our Facebook groups as well. So really, right. really awesome resource. And while we're talking about Facebook groups, let me plug the, the Ricky real estate Facebook group as well. So if you guys are in there, go join. There's like 20,000 people in there, lots, lots of good activity happening. So uh, the next thing I want to hit, um, Chrissy, is, is like, how are you doing your showings remotely? Um, I, I know that was a big concern for me, right? I was in California, mm -hmm. my long-term rentals in, in Louisiana, and I, I just thought it might have been too much of a pain. I think now, knowing what I know now, I could probably do it. But I guess, how, mm -hmm. how are you managing that piece, like doing the showings remotely? Yeah, like I said, we have been fortunate enough. We haven't had a turnover, so we haven't had to do one remotely yet. But our plan is, like I said, we're going to have a cleaner in there. And I would ideally like the cleaner to be there um, and kind of just have three people walk through while she's there. And then if we do not find... Um, a tenant through that. I think I'll just have a lockbox set on the door with um, a code at, with the key to the house. And then we will kind of call them, vet them over the phone. And kind of if they pass that initial test, have them go in and take a look around, I think is the process or system moving forward that we're going to we're going to test out so we don't have to fly back. There's a back. bunch of software too that you can right. get. Like I think Show Mojo is one. Um, and then even some of the you know, more popular property management software right. is kind of incorporating different things. Are you using any kind of software to manage the rentals right now? Not. We are a little bit old school. Um, so we use all the payment apps, um, just your typical bank, you know, Zelle, Venmo, Cash App, whatever. Um, and then I just have the spreadsheets down right now. So we... We're, we're debating on if we're going to go into like QuickBooks or I think you mentioned Stessa a few times, whether that's kind of the right system moving forward. But at this time, we do not have a particular software we use. The one I do use a lot, which I really like, is the Mint Budget kind of tracker. And that kind of just gives me a good overview of everything. And I can see all the money going in and out and be able to kind of piece it into the each rental property from there. Yeah, there's one that you want to try, um, Rent Ready. They're actually a show sponsor for us uh, pretty frequently, and they right. have a promo going right now where it's only a dollar for a year. Okay. So, I mean, just even just to go right. around in there and to play around, they have a demo and stuff like that. Right. But yeah, awesome. Um, and then another one's our Buildium, Appfolio. Yes. Uh, different, because once you get... I trust I know. you get it. You will not want to go. We back. are like oh, already. I'm like <laughs> dreading doing our taxes this year. It's like now we're starting. We're going to have to compile everything. And I have like all the properties. I have to really finalize the books on them. Yeah. And a lot of the software <laughs> have onboarding specialists too. So that when you're looking right. at softwares, look at the ones that do it for free. Um, okay. Because they'll actually yeah. just like a live person will help you get everything um, uploaded into there. I, my life changed yeah. when I <laughs> managed a software. So I'm like a huge advocate. I worked off when I first took over the apartment complex. Yeah. With a sheet. Yeah. With just like lines drawn yep, they across paid. the ruler. <laughs> and then they would use a, a red marker and put a check if the person paid rent. It's getting there. I'm sure probably with this next property coming online, we're, we're going to have to change something pretty quickly here. Yeah. So I guess one, one quick question, Matt. So you guys have scaled really quickly, right? Like, yeah. you know, to, to go from zero to 24 since, you know, summer 2019, that, that's pretty fast growth. Mm -hmm. What's been the biggest challenge for you guys? Like, like what, what's been the hardest part, would you say? Learning real estate as we go. I mean, like I said before, we kind of bought that uh, first property, I didn't know much. And I feel like almost every day is kind of something. It's a learning curve. And one of the biggest challenges, and I'll never, ever, ever make this mistake again, but one of the first tenants we put into kind of that back storage, like industrial space I've been talking about, it was like such a quick turnaround. Like, like I said, I was leaving for like vacation, like for four weeks. I'm like, we just want to get this filled. Like we, it's not even worth anything, whatever. Like, we'll just get this person in here. And it was a nightmare. Like we made the awful mistake of not running a background check on him 
or like um, running his credit or background check. And I will never do that again because we ran it on the first tenant we put into the building. But for some reason, we thought this space was just kind of like flying under the radar, like not like a big deal. We're like, oh, whatever. We'll just, you know, we, his application looks good. His bank statements look good. Let's just like, he's fine. And we put him in there and he was fine for like six months. And kind of when his lease expired, we knew how much that space was worth. So we're like, we're like, okay, you can either leave or we're like bumping the rent like this one or the other and we bumped the rent and he like paid one month and then COVID happened and of course he from there just stopped paying stopped communicating and it was a nightmare trying to get him out especially with eviction moratoriums and I kind of go back to always make sure you're surrounded by a good team and luckily we had a good legal team in place that helped us kind of find some loopholes and technicalities on him that we were able to eventually get him out um but always 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 screen your tenants i will never ever and, make and that mistake people say, again right? like it, it's not a matter of if you're going to evict your yes. tenant it's a matter of when and yeah, I've, yeah i've never gone through that process myself but i think every new real estate investor should expect that it'll happen at some point point. and as, as a mm-hmm. quick side note if you guys haven't seen the movie uh guest house with paulie shore on netflix it's like every landlord's worst nightmare where basically the, this couple buys his house they inherit paulie shore as a tenant yeah. and he's just like the worst tenant ever and they can't get him out so oh, yeah do i say uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty full. Yeah, he's got the pool house in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. So oh my that's how on Netflix. If you guys haven't seen it yet. It'll, it'll give you a good laugh. Um, so I, I want to dive, Christy, in, into one of your deals specifically. So do you have one in mind that we can kind of do a deep dive on the numbers? Yeah, of course. It, it, it would definitely be like that first deal. I think, especially with how quickly that the market has changed in San Diego now, we look at kind of the purchase price and the the gross rents we're getting on that property, and it was at the time, definitely a home rent deal. It's just taken us a while to get it up to this kind of performance. So let's go okay. into that one. All right. Awesome. So I, I want to set the table for the listeners first. So I'll ask you just some, some quick hitting questions and, and give me your response and we'll do a, a bit of a deeper dive afterwards. But what was the, what was the purchase price on this one? Uh, the purchase price was negotiated down to 712000 all right. There's people in, in Ashley's neck of the woods when you say negotiated down to seven hundred twenty thousand. That is a register. Right. All right. So seven hundred twenty thousand was the purchase price. Um, what was your down payment on it? We put twenty five percent down because we are not living in this one. And what's your you know your your monthly expenses, principal, interest, taxes, insurance? Thirty four hundred and seventy dollars. And then what are you renting it for? Our gross rents on the property right now are sixty two hundred dollars or sixty two hundred and sixty dollars. You're netting somewhere around like what is that twenty five ish hundred bucks a month? Yeah, and so we actually installed after a coin operated washer dryer, and each unit like has families in it. So we actually are it, from the coin washer dryers probably netting an additional hundred dollars safely each month too, which kind mm-hmm. of gives us a nice little chunk of income, which is really nice. That's awesome, right? I mean, so you're, you're yeah. obviously spending a lot more on the property at you know seven hundred twenty k, but you're also netting a pretty handsome amount at. $2,500 a month, yes, right? right. That, that, that definitely beats, you know, the hundred dollars, you know, per door, right. you know, $100 per door. Exactly. Per door. Um, so, so you, you talked a little bit about the financing piece already, but it, you, you, you just went like a conventional, uh, investment loan on this property. We did. So it was just your typical convention, conventional investment loan. And then we are finishing a refinance out tomorrow or Monday. So we will get an additional $300 in cash flow, um, awesome. that we will be able to claim on the property. So we are just doing loan and term. We did try to pull some money out of the property, but the appraisal came back a little wonky, I'll say, without having to go into much details um, with the comps that the appraiser used. And it's such a unique property. And I didn't realize that we would necessarily have this issue in what they call like C-class neighborhoods. Our realtor kind of walked us through it, but essentially there's not enough comps in these neighborhoods to really compare to show the true value of the property. So it did appraise higher, of course, than what we purchased it for, but way under really what I think we could sell it for just based on kind of the numbers. What made you decide not to try and um, fight the appraisal? You know, we've had a couple people on that yeah, actually, who you know, it. requested another appraisal. What what made you decide to, to keep going with this? I mean, you're getting the extra mm-hmm. cash flow. Was that, you know, we thought about contesting the appraisal and paying for another one, but we, or we realized that they would, pr- if the appraiser came through again, he would probably just pull the same comps and the comps are so off on what the ones they're pulling that there's nothing else listed on the market right now where they 
could pull different comps. So I feel like even if we were to contest it or fight it, if they pulled those exact same comps, we'd come up with the exact same results. So we we're kind of happy with just the increased cash flow anyways, um, and kind of where we're sitting right now in our cash position for our next deal. But we were, you know, yeah, we were a little disappointed, but we figured if we contested it, they would just use the same comps again, because there's really not a lot in that direct neighborhood. What would you do different um, so that next time you're more prepared to estimate what the appraisal is actually going to be? So now that you've been through the whole appraisal process and, Mm -hmm. you know, you've seen what comps they actually pulled, what would you Mm -hmm. recommend to rookies so that they don't get into that same situation? What would you have done different? Yeah, I think I would have tried to pull some comps ahead of time, honestly, and really kind of get a look on the market. I mean, regardless, we are going to refinance it for that lower rate anyways. But I really think like we we had our broker try and contest them, but I think, and our realtor pull additional comps and sent to that appraiser, but maybe, I mean, they talk about this all the time, like trying to send a couple comps to them ahead of time, trying to like prompt them a little, whether they take that receptive or not. No, but once the report's kind of written, I I think it's pretty hard to get it thrown changed or thrown out, it seems. I, I want to talk a little bit about how you found the deal, Chrissy. Was this, you know, wholesale, MLS, you know, pocket listing? Yeah, I mean, it was honestly an MLS through the realtor who I who I spoke of. She um, sent us quite a few investment summaries. And like I said, they weren't kind of penciling out originally to our, you know, $2,000, $2,500 like desired cash flow. I think originally when we penciled it out, it was only going to be around like $1,000 cash flows. And we're like, ah, that's not very good for how much money we're putting down. And but the the kicker is she sent over this investment summary and in the MLS listing, I talked about the space, had the space in the back that the current owner was using as like his workshop. He had quite a big portfolio in San Diego. So he was just using it kind of as his headquarters for all his maintenance guys to kind of go in and out. And the realtor listing it says like, yeah, you probably can rent it for $500 to $1,000. But that was listed in that like MLS description. And I think a lot of people looked over that and did not factor that into their numbers. And yes, you can't use those numbers for conventional financing. But I remember my husband saw that and he's like, this is actually very valuable space. And for how close this is listed to downtown, like he's like, even if we just get $500 a month out of it, like that's already bumping our cash flow to $1,600. Um, a month. And then now we rent it for $1,500 a month. And that's, you know, that's bumping our cash flow to that $2,500, $2,600 range, which is phenomenal. But that, to answer your question on the MLS, but always read the descriptions. Yeah, that's a really valuable point because we've had other guests on the show that have also said that they found these kind of stale listings that the only reason they were still up is because they had been up for so long and people weren't really paying attention to where the value was. Like, I can't remember where it was, but someone bought something a while. Anyway, it's something that happens pretty regularly, right? Where where Mm -hmm. there's like a really cool or unique part of the property that adds additional value. So for those of you that are listening, if you see some of those listings that have gone stale that might've been up for a while, see if there's anything unique or special about the property that maybe other investors are passing up on. And then, mm-hmm. you know, if you're lucky enough, you get like Christy, where you're, you're cash flowing 20, 2,500 bucks a month and then everything works out well. Yeah. We had the guest on Tony that um, she actually bought an Airbnb and turned it into a house hack. There you go. Right. Oh, you know, wow. We're thinking of maybe, yeah. yeah. So it was a, a listing that had been sitting for a long time, I think over mm-hmm. a year. Mm-hmm. And um, we'll link we'll link it in the the show notes. I don't remember exactly what episode it was, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, she had found it and it was listed on the commercial side. So like people who are actually looking to house hack weren't looking on the commercial side for a place to live. Mm-hmm. And she turned um, the main house into her house, and then um, there was like two additional dwellings on the property, and she's renting them. Wow! Out. So yeah, yeah there's definitely unique deals out there. You just have to yeah. know how to look. creative ways to force cash yeah. flow or more cash yeah. flow. I want to take us next to the mindset segment. Christy, this is probably my favorite part of the show, but it's where we kind of do a deep dive into the mindset of the real estate investors that we're talking with. A lot of times the people who want to get started in real estate investing, all of our rookies, they know what to do. They've read all the books, but they're just, you know, mentally can't get past or get those steps on that they need to, to actually get moving. So what were mm-hmm. maybe some misconceptions you had as 
you know, a would-be real estate investor that turned out to be totally not true, right? Something you were afraid of that just didn't really materialize when you started investing. The horror stories, you know, like, oh, that's going to be such a headache. Like, you don't want to do that. Why? You know, and he's like the big guy working in a, the corporate world, like, you know, having a nice cushy salary. He's like, well, he's like, you're going to just have all these headaches. It's going to be a disaster. You're going to lose money. Uh, you don't want to do that. Like, why would you waste your time doing that? It's like, well, because I don't necessarily want to be you and work in a, you know, the corporate world. Like, I mean, to put it like nicely, but I mean, I guess that's not, but I think just like, don't be afraid of kind of those horror stories. I mean, I, we have enough of them, but honestly, it, it's really not that bad. I think we always say like 10% of life is like the obstacle or not. We, someone always says 10% of life is the obstacles that come your way. And 90% of it is how you handle them. And we always try and like, remember that, like, okay, this is bad. This is very bad. <laughs> like, this is not good right now. Like we're, you know, we're struggling, but I mean, there's always a way to manage and handle those kind of ways around those issues and those tenant issues. And it, it's really, really how you manage the situation because it's going to be hard. I mean, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't let that headache stop you because we, we always say the good days outweigh the bad. And we've definitely had our fair share of bad days, but it, it can be so scary when you're venturing off into this world of real estate investing, because, you know, a lot of people maybe don't know other real estate investors, like in their personal circle. So they're the right. only ones that are listening to the bigger pockets podcast and watching the YouTube videos and reading the book. So they're gaining all of this knowledge. And then when they go and talk to their friend or their family member about what they're trying to do, you know, they, they kind of look at them sideways, like, you know, like, what do you mean? You know, what, yeah. what do you mean you're going to go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on this property? that's going to give you, you know, 200 bucks a month or something like that. Right. Like yeah. it just doesn't connect for them. So right. I think that's the important importance of community, right? It's right. surrounding yourself with other people who are investing, other people who have the same goals and other people who aren't like Uncle Bob that all they want to do is kind of break you down and give you the negativity. So yeah, I, I love absolutely. your perspective on that. Um, I, sorry, one other comment, right? Because you, you, you kind of mentioned this, that, that it's, I can't, you said it so beautifully. I'm trying to make sure I don't mess yeah. this up, but you said life is ten, like 90%. Say one more time. No way I don't mess it up. And, and, <laughs> and it's not my quote, um, uh, but my husband says it all the time. So it's 10% uh, of life is the obstacles that come your way. And the other 90% is how you handle them. That so we, those are kind of like, not words we live by, but I mean, it's up there because sometimes you know, we get like these crazy tenant issues because we mostly invest in these C-class uh, buildings or neighborhoods. And, you know, it's it's really just how you how you handle the situations. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, that's really great. So I'm going to take us to the rookie request line. Okay. And um, anybody can call in and leave us a voicemail at 888-5-ROOKIE. Leave us a question and we may play it here on the show and have our guest answer it for you. Okay. Here's today's question from Greg in Salt Lake City. My name is Greg, and I'm based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. My wife and I are new real estate investors, and we have our current house ready to rent. It should cash flow nicely, and we have cash saved up and ready to buy a property, move out, and actually start making some money. Our realtor, who's also a real estate investor, recommends that we buy a more expensive house as a move-up house because it can be harder to buy you know, a nicer house down the line once you get a number of properties accumulated. We're kind of torn on if we should buy a more expensive house or go in at a lower price point and focus on accumulating some more lower dollar rentals. I'd love to hear your feedback. If your realtor is an investor, that's great. But I think you just need to look at your situation and that's great that your house is going to cash flow that much. And I think that's awesome that that is your plan for that house. And you're not necessarily, you know, going to sell that, but I think just really look at that situation and kind of what we're even looking at right now, which might be a great option for you is trying to find if you're, especially in those higher um, expensive areas, trying to find a property, I would say a property you can house hack because I'm not necessarily one who wants to like share walls anymore, but even if you can find a property with like two houses on it, um, and that way you kind of get that nice living situation. Um, and then you can rent out the other, the other house or the other, um, accessory dwelling unit. You know, if you kind of want to maybe move up 
a little like your realtor is saying, and you don't necessarily want to have to uh, downgrade your lifestyle, I would definitely just look into those options. And I mean, I think that's a great way to still get a nicer house, but still not be tied to that huge mortgage payment. So kind of get those creative ways of how you can make money um, on buying an additional property with um, kind of those extra kind of cash flow points. Yeah. I like Christy's take on it is that you can still get a nice house, but just have it as a house hack. So you're still getting additional income. Because if you do go out and buy a really nice, expensive house, like we talked about earlier, that's going to hurt your debt to income when you go to try and get investment loans on your property. But if you start building those investment loans as you're getting that debt, you're also getting income, which is going Mm -hmm. to offset that. Or if you just get the nice house first, that's not going to do that. So uh, um, I'm sure your realtor has good intentions, but I would I would say the opposite. Um, yeah. But I mm-hmm. I lived in a, an old farmhouse for a couple of years for free, and yeah. we made the mistake and built a brand new house. And like now I look back and I'm like oh my god, we should have like stayed there five more years <laughs> and like lived for free in a paid off house. But nope, I had to have my dream. <laughs> <house>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. and, le- and- learn from my mistakes. <laughs> And on the house hacking piece, right? Like I think it was episode 49, right? Actually, where we had Andres on there where he talked about house hacking the new builds. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what, you know, I don't know where, you, where you're at, but if you can go out and buy like a new construction, you can get in at three and a half percent down and, and you can house hack and, and make a ton of yeah. cash flow. So um, sure. different strategies, right? Um, all right. So I, I want to take us into the, the next segment here, Christy, which is our, our kind of random question. Um, I, I think for me, the, the question I want to ask you is, why jump into the multifamily um, units first, as opposed to kind of, you know, cutting your teeth or getting started in the single family space? I think a lot of folks might have some fear or some hesitation around right. starting off with five units from day one. What made you not so afraid to do that? I guess, first of all, the multifamily for us made the most sense. It was the best kind of return on investment in our area. And we needed at least kind of those three or four units for it really to like make sense for us in this area. I don't think it was ne- that's necessarily true in other areas, but for that return we were looking for, um, that that is kind of what made sense. And once we kind of got into that first one, it didn't seem as scary anymore. And we've kind of continued and progressed from there. But to go back to your point, I mean, I think Honestly, I had so much confidence in my husband that we were going to figure it out no matter what. And I was like, I, it really comes back down to kind of your partner, whether it's, you know, your significant other, your partner, and just having confidence in them and trusting the process, because especially if they've done so much research behind it, um, ahead of time and their, their intentions are good, then I think sometimes you just need to trust, trust yourself and take that leap of faith. And then also just remember to like, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, I think we, I kind of think that a lot when we get scared about doing some of these bigger deals, it's like, well, what's the worst that can happen? I guess we sell it and we'll probably be pretty close to, you know, getting our money back if we just sell it and we get out, you know? So if you only lose, if you were to buy it tomorrow and then sell it, turn around and sell it the next week, you'll probably lose some money. But other than that, it's it's really not, you know, it's pretty non-consequential in my mind if your plan is to buy and hold um, and you have done the research ahead of time. I mean, do not just go and buy any property, like do not force it. I would just make sure um, that you are doing your research on your deals and you're buying like good, solid deals and you're not forcing the numbers to make sense. Christine, my question is to you about your W-2 income. Did mm-hmm. you replace that yet with your cash flow from your properties? And what are the next steps for you? What's the next goal to reach? I mean, if we're just counting the property income towards me, yes, <laughs> and not towards my husband, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours, One for, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I would say we're pretty much doubled uh, my W-2 income right by now, which is, I wasn't making, we're in a sales job, so kind of low salary um, with um, high bonus. Um, but yeah, I would say with this eight unit closing, pretty much if I get to take all the cash flow, then um, yeah, I'm pretty we've pretty much doubled the cash flow or from the W-2 income, which is amazing. And we say it all the time, like you don't really realize how much your time is worth until you kind of take that leap of faith and make sure you have a security blanket, like just please do not go ahead and quit your job tomorrow. But um, 
I think it really shows how valuable your time is and how much kind of that corporate world knows that and can, you know, really not take advantage of it. But like, if you are to go out on your own and you are passionate about something, um, I think you need to realize you're easily going to be a six figure position on your own, whether if you're making under, you know, a hundred thousand dollars right now, I think, you know, as long as you're dedicated and you have the right mindset, you can accomplish a lot. I love that. And congratulations. I mean, yeah. that's really awesome. In a year and a half, you were yeah. able to double what you were getting at your, your W2. Yeah. It's a really great accomplishment. Yeah. Can you tell us um, where everyone can find out um, a little bit more about you and where to reach you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I'm on Instagram. Um, it is just my name, Christy Lesage. It is more of kind of like, I guess, a personal page for my friends, but I am looking, our goal for this year is to network more and connect with more um, investors. We have been a little bit kind of heads down, like go, go, go lately. So we have not done as good of a job as I would have liked. So I am on Instagram. I do post a little bit of real estate on there when we're going through our deals and our inspections, um, but would love to connect with you, anyone there. I am on Bigger Pockets also. So, and I am very guilty of not updating my bigger pockets profile page. So please go connect with me there and it'll give me some motivation to upload all my deals <laughs> and be more active on that bigger pockets website. So that's a great place uh, to connect with me as well. Um, and I'm also always available um, over email to kind of connect with mentorship. And if you just reach out to me on one of those pages, I'll shoot it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, we'll link all this information too at biggerpockets.com forward slash rookie 53. Thank you guys for listening. Um, make sure that you join our Facebook group. Just search Real Estate Rookie. And Christy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And I mean, providing huge motivation uh, for anyone else that's thinking they want to get out of their W-2 and get into to real estate. So yeah. thank you very much. Of course. Happy to be here. And it was so much fun this morning uh, getting to chat with you guys. I'm Ashley Kerr at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony Robinson at Tony J. Robinson. And make sure you guys listen to our newest episode coming out Saturday.